Mr. Baxter states his opinion concerning the terms of church communion in these words, quote, I think this is all that should be required of any church or members, ordinarily, to be professed. In general, I do believe all that is contained in the sacred canonical scriptures, and particularly I believe all explicitly contained in the ancient creed, and I resolve upon obedience to the Ten Commandments and whatever else I can learn of the will of God. And for all their points, it is enough to preserve both truth and peace that men promise not to preach against them, to contradict them, though they subscribe them not. Uh, that from the Life of Baxter, page 198. As to this plan, it may be observed first that the practice of latitudinarian communion is not agreeable to it, for when Presbyterians and Episcopalians and Pado Baptists and Antipado Baptists have sacramental communion together according to the scheme of Catholic communion, they do not they cannot promise to contradict one another. Uh, secondly, that sacramental communion cannot, on this plan, be refused to the grossest heretics, such as Arians and Socinians. For, as this plan is opposed to an orthodox confession of faith, it must be understood of the mere words of Scripture, even in opposition to the true sense of it. It is true that when this was objected to Mr. Baxter, he said that those heretics ought to be called to an account for contradicting or abusing the truth to which they had subscribed. But it is evident that this answer is a mere shift and nothing to the purpose, for they cannot be convicted of any heresy without charging them with contradicting the sense of, the, of Scripture, a charge which they could reject as easily as they could reject an orthodox confession of faith. The justice of trying them by the sense of Scripture is evidently given, uh, is evidently given up in setting aside confessions of faith, and it cannot consistently be, and it cannot consistently with this plan be resorted to. Thirdly. That the reasons which would warrant a church to require an, an approbation of what is called the Apostles' Creed could warrant them to require an approbation of the Westminster Confession. The former is of no more authority than the latter. Fourth, that this scheme tends to bring all testimonies for truth, all condemnation of errors as contrary to the word of God, nay, all preaching and instruction as it lies in giving the sense of Scripture, and not a mere repetition of the words or syllables into contempt. For according to this scheme, a person may disregard all these without being liable to any church censure. Though I would not agree to all the great swelling words which some have used in expressing their admiration of Mr. Baxter, yet I have too much esteem for him as a zealous Christian, a laborious minister, and in some respects a useful writer, to suppose that he would have desired us to follow him any further than he followed Christ. So I think we are as little to follow him as his so I think we are as little to follow him in his indigested latitudinarian scheme of communion as in his neonomian doctrine. It may be added that however zealous Mr. Baxter was for the latitudinarian scheme of communion, yet he did not go so far as some of our more modern advocates for it do in charging such as decline it with separating from the communion of the Catholic Church and in asserting that we cannot decline the sacramental communion of a particular church on account of obstinacy and corruption or backsliding without unchurching that church. On the question, whether it be our duty to seek peace with the Anabaptists, he observes that there is a peace of actual communion in the worship of God as members of the same particular church. This, he says, we owe not to every Christian, though sincere in the main. On another question, he says, this, uh, on another question, he says the same act, as coming to common prayer or sacrament in the church, might become a duty to some men and a sin to others by the diversity of their stations, relations, pastors, churches, occasions, circumstances. If Mr. Baxter means that, though the joining in what was erroneous or superstitious in the common prayer and the mode of celebrating the sacrament used in the established Church of England was really sinful, yet it might become a duty on the accounts he mentions. The truth of the affirmation cannot be admitted. It shows, however, that he did not impute the consequences just now mentioned to the refusal of latitudinarian communion. Alex. The divines who were members of the Westminster Assembly seem to have entertained the same opinion with Mr. Baxter as to the freedom of church communion. For notwithstanding all their complaints of the abuses and corruptions of the established church, they nevertheless, after the year 1660, when Charles II was restored, continued in their fellowship, continued in her fellowship, excuse me. They offered, as a plan of accommodation with the Episcopalians, Archbishop Usher's model of primitive episcopacy, the chief feature of which is that without destroying the distinctive titles of Archbishop, Bishop, and Presbyter, as known in England, they might be conjoined in the government of the church. A bishop being perpetual president in the ecclesiastical assemblies made up of presbyters, 
they offered that the surplice, the, the cross and baptism, the kneeling at the communion, should be left indifferent. They were content to set aside the assembly's confession and to let the articles of the Church of England take place with some few amendments. Many Presbyterian ministers, after they had been ejected for nonconformity, had held, excuse me, held communion with the established Church of England in her public ordinances. Samuel Clark, unable to subscribe the Act of Uniformity, laid aside his ministry and attended the Church of England both as a hearer and as a communicant. Zachary Crofton, a warm advocate for the Solemn League and Covenant, while a prisoner in the Tower for his nonconformity, attended the chapel service, was against separation from the parish churches, and wrote a plea for the communion with the established church. John Farrell, in humble, peaceable, laborious divine, when ejected for nonconformity, used to go to the established church, as his people also did, and either before or after doing so, to preach in private. Daniel Pointel, so remarkably blessed in his ministry that he had scarcely a prayerless family in his parish, used after his ejection, ejectment by the Bartholomew Act to hold ministerial fellowship with the establishment, preaching after the order of the Church of England to his flock at Staplehurst. Mr. Ambrose and Mr. Cole of Preston declared that they could read the common prayer and should do it, and twenty ministers before whom they made this declaration approved their proceeding. Joseph Elaney, though he suffered long imprisonment because he would not cease from his ministry after his ejectment, ejectment, yet often attended the worship of the parish churches and encouraged his people to do so. Anthony Burgess, a member of the Westminster Assembly, after his ejectment, lived in a lived in a very cheerful and pious manner, frequenting and encouraging the ministry of the conforming clergyman. George Hopkins, a Presbyterian, after his ejectment, frequented the parish church with his family, received the Holy Communion, received the Holy Communion, and did all things required of him as a lay member of the Church of England. These ministers were disposed to be one with every body that was with Christ. They abhorred a close and narrow spirit, which affects or confines religion to a party. They thought that no more conditions should be made for the communion of the churches than Christ had made for communion with him, and that nothing should be, more, should be made necessary to Christian communion but what Christ has made necessary, or what is indeed necessary to one's being a Christian. Rufus. These and similar commonplace expressions may be used either in a true or false sense. We are often misled by first taking such propositions for self-evident truths, then applying them in an erroneous sense to a particular subject. It is true that we should be one with those who are one with Christ. If it be understood of their state, and of all those things in which they are one with Christ, but it is false if it be understood of those things in their profession and practice in which they are not one with him, but are chargeable with declining from the rule of his word. We should be one with Aaron, the saint of the Lord, yet we are not to be one with him in the making of the golden calf. That we are to abhor a close and narrow spirit that confines religion to a party is true if it means that we are to... If it, mean that we are to beware of judging persons not to be in a state of grace or not accepted with God in what they do according to his word, merely upon the ground of their belonging to such a party. But it is most false if it mean that they who hold the truth of their profession may never be reduced to a few, while the great body of professors are involved in error and corruption. In the 4th century, the profession of the truth concerning the deity of Christ was for a time confined to Athanasius and a small party that adhered to him, while, as the ju judicious Mr. Durham observes, many eminent godly men were, out of infirmity, at last brought to subscribe to the way of the Arians. It is true, no more conditions should be made for the communion of churches than Christ has made for communion with him. If it be understood in this sense, that nothing should be a condition or term of communion in the churches, but what belongs to the appointed means of promoting our communion with him. But it is false if it means that a church should not require her members anything without or before which a person cannot have any communion with him. For a church must always require a public agreement to her scriptural confession of the truth, a public acknowledgment of public offenses in order to sacramental communion with her. But these things rightly performed are rather effects of communion with Christ than previous conditions of it, and in some cases, Persons may have communion with Christ without them.
that nothing should be necessary to church communion but what Christ has made necessary to the well-being of a Christian is true, but that nothing should be necessary to church communion but what Christ has made necessary to the being of a Christian is false. For a church must require baptism in order to commune at the Lord's table, and yet baptism is not necessary to the being of a Christian. A church must require upright walking according to the truth of the gospel of all her communicants, and yet that the being of a Christian may continue, as in the case of Peter, in Galatians 2, verses 11 and 14. While in some respects he is not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel cannot be denied. The use of such phrases to express a judgment of charity concerning the general character of persons and churches and the ground we have to hope for the Reformation may be right and commendable. But when they are used, as we have reason to be apprehensive is often the case, in order to extenuate some acknowledged evil and to evade the necessity of holding some revealed truth or duty in opposition to that evil, they are of hurtful and dangerous tendency. With regard to the instances you have adduced of neoconformist or nonconformists, excuse me, having sacramental communion with the established Church of England, it may be observed that, as the Westminster Assembly seemed to have had in had no view of an occasional church communion between churches of different and opposite public professions in the same local situation or on terms different with those of fixed communion. So it does not appear that the Presbyterian nonconformists in the reign of Charles II had any such notion, but an opinion seems then to have been prevailing seems then to have prevailed among them that it belonged to the civil magistrate to establish the true religion. Even the ingenious author of Recitus Estruendum allows the power of the civil magistrate in matters of religion. Quote, to preserve, says he, the worship of God in purity and his worshippers in peace is a flower which adorns the royal diadem more than all his own diamonds and rubies, unquote. They seem to have carried this matter too far and to have thought it unwarrantable to separate from a Protestant Episcopal church when established by the civil magistrate. This opinion was manifestly erroneous. For no sanction of the civil power could make anything in the public profession of the church or in the worship of God lawful, which is, as they had a few years before declared prelacy and, and the ceremonies of the, of the established church to be, contrary to his word. This error led some of these ejected ministers to desist from preaching the word of God, and others who preached occasionally to decline the dispensation of the Lord's Supper, and also to join in the communion of the established church. To attempt to justify their conduct in respect of their, their proposal to leave the surplice, crossing in baptism, and kneeling at the Lord's table indifferent, to set aside the Assembly's confession, and to establish in, in its place the Articles of the Church of England would be in vain. When the Westminster Confession of Faith was formed, a considerable progress was made in the reformation of the Church of God in England and Scotland. Ministers and people were bound by the command of God to hold fast what they had attained and to carry on the good work which had been begun. These nations were also bound to all the reformation that had been attained by the oath of God into which they had entered. Nothing could be more absurd than the attempts that were sometimes made to reconcile the Solemn League and Covenant to their compliances with its hierarchy and superstition, with the hierarchy and superstition which these nations were bound by the covenant to eradicate. Some have said that the Solemn League and Covenant could not bind any to an adherence to the confession of faith, former Presbyterian Church government, and director of public worship, because these formulae these formularies were not then composed. This would have had some color of reason if they had not precisely corresponded with what was sworn to, that is, if they had not actually exhibited the several parts of Reformation mentioned in that covenant, a confession of faith, a form of church government, a directory for worship according to the word of God, and the example of the best Reformed churches in opposition to popacy, popery, prelacy, superstition, heresy, schism, and profaneness. But this corruption, uh, but this correspondence, excuse me, was evident and undeniable, and therefore these nations were bound by that covenant to adhere to the whole of the Reformation described in these forms of sound words. While that was the covenanted Reformation, it is plain that the falling away from any part of it was an open violation of the covenant.